Welcome back. This is part two of Daniel and Revelation, insights from the perspective of a member of the Church of Jesus Christ. My name is Jody Stoddard. If you missed the first one, you might want to go back and watch that one first because we kind of add line upon line. So you're going to need the insight from the first one to stay up with what we're talking about now. So the background from part one had led us up to the point where we were getting ready to move into the seventh seal. But before we could talk about those things, we needed to get out of the sixth seal. So that's what we're going to do now. According to LDS.org, Joseph Smith, Skousen, McConkie, and others believe that each seal represents a 1,000 year period in the history of the earth. Remember, it took 6,000 years or six days for God to create the world. So six days and on the seventh he rested. So we have had six seals and now we're entering the seventh seal of the millennium, which is, will be a rest time for the earth. And if this is true, we should have left the sixth seal and entered into the seventh seal around the year 2000. So let's review the things that were supposed to happen in the sixth seal before we move to the seventh seal. In Revelation 6, we read in verse 12, And I beheld when he had opened the sixth seal, and lo, there was a great earthquake. Many people are still waiting for this quake before they feel we can move on. First of all, the scriptures say when the sixth seal opened. Well, that should have been about a thousand years ago. So we need to decide, was there a quake then? Yes, there was. What if we had an earthquake today that killed over a million people? Does that sound like it might qualify for what John saw in Revelation 6? What if that many people died on just the continents of Africa, Asia, and Europe alone? with more unrecorded deaths taking place on the other four yet undiscovered continents that were similar in magnitude. Would that qualify? What if over a million people would have died when the world's population was much smaller than it is today? That million people would have made an even greater impact on humanity then than if it happened today, right? But can you even imagine a million people dying in an earthquake today? Well, in 1202 AD, which according to Joseph Smith would have been in the sixth seal, there was such an earthquake. It killed 1.1 million people. Keep in mind that this was when the total population for the three record keeping continents, which documented the effects of this quake, was a mere 370 million people, compared with the population of those same three continents today of 6.3 billion people, or 17 times more population now than then. So it stands to reason that the impact on humanity of a quake of that magnitude today, if it were to only affect those three continents, would have killed 18.7 million people. I share the comparison to show that 1.1 million dying in a quake in 1202 was much more catastrophic than one might have comprehended at first glance. But even to comprehend a quake that would take out a million people is hard to wrap one's mind around. In order to recognize the magnitude of that staggering number, let's look at the history of earthquakes. According to Wikipedia, the earthquake history was limited prior to Christ, but there are records beginning after Christ. In that first thousand years AD, guesstimates show that around 900,000 or less than a million people died in earthquakes over that 1,000 year period, which would have been considered the fifth seal. As we move into the second thousand years or sixth seal between 1,000 to 2000 AD, we see a huge increase in just the first 200 years, where one and a half million people die in quakes. All in all, an estimated five million people died of earthquakes in the sixth seal. In fact, the quakes had become so frequent between 1132 AD to 1202 AD that people had taken to living in caves because they were tired of their houses falling down on their heads. In Revelation 6.15 we read, And the kings of the earth, and the great men, and the rich men, and the chief captains, and the mighty men, and every bondman, and every freeman, hid themselves in the dens in the rocks of the mountains. There will be more earthquakes, large ones. There's one that's prophesied in Revelation 8, which would be in the seventh seal. And there's more after that. But as for the one prophesied to happen in the beginning of the sixth seal, it did happen in 1202 AD. 
also there are some more prophecies that were to take place in the sixth seal. Let's discover what those were. Revelation 7, 1 says, And after these things I saw four angels standing on the four corners of the earth, holding the four winds of the earth, that the wind should not blow on the earth, nor the sea, nor on any tree. And I saw another angel, Elias, ascending from the east having the seal of the living living God. And he cried with a loud voice to the four angels to whom it was given to hurt the earth and sea, saying, Hurt not the earth, neither the sea, nor the trees, until we have sealed the servants of our God in their foreheads. So here again we have references to temples and their importance in the sealing ordinances and, they, and the protection that they offer the saints. This is a good time to remember, too, how it was said that the saints needed the sealing ordinances of the Nauvoo Temple, prior to their heading west in order to have the strength and protection to survive. To add additional testimony to that of Elias and his saying that the saints needed to be sealed prior to devastation taking place, up through the year 1999, we had 68 operating temples around the world. And then an astounding thing happened in the year 2000. We dedicated 34 more temples. In just one year, we built half again as many temples as it took us 170 years to build. There's one of these temples in particular that is described in Revelation 7. Before we talk about and discover what that is, let me give you a little background. A few weeks after a certain temple was dedicated early in 2000, my husband and our ward missionaries at the time attended a large Northwest regional leadership training. Afterwards, the missionaries came back and they came over to my house and shared something with me. They said that a 70 had told them that the seventh seal was opened and that the temple dedication was a catalyst. And I thought, if that's true, I should be able to find it in the scriptures. In reading Joel chapter 1, I found these verses. 14. Sanctify ye fast, call a solemn assembly. Gather the elders and all the inhabitants of the land into the house of the Lord your God, and cry unto the Lord. Alas for the day, for the day of the Lord is at hand, and as a destruction from the Almighty shall it come. I thought, okay, that's calling for what sounds like a temple dedication, house of the Lord, solemn assembly. But I thought, is there anything else I can find? Then in Revelation 7, I found this, starting in verse 9. And after this, I beheld, and lo, a great multitude, which no man could number, of all nations and kindreds and tongues and people stood before the throne and before the Lord, clothed with white robes and palms in their hands, and cried with a loud voice, saying, Salvation to our God, which sitteth upon the throne and unto the Lamb. And all the angels stood round about the throne and about the elders, and the four beasts and fell, de fell before the throne on their faces and worshiped God, saying, Amen, blessing and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and honor and power and might be unto our God forever and ever. Amen. And there it was, a great multitude, all of the inhabitants. Can you think of an event that fulfilled these scriptures? April 6, 2000 was the dedication of the Palmyra Temple. And it was the first and only two to date that were televised worldwide, where all members over the age of 12 could attend the temple dedication. People had to have a recommend to get in, and the doors to the stake centers were closed 15 minutes prior and locked. With 11 million members, there would have been no way that all worthy members could have attended without a worldwide dedication that was televised like this. Why does it sound like a temple dedication? It says they are clothed in white robes. The throne of God refers to a temple. They have palms in their hands, and all members were requested to bring white hankies to represent the palms thrown down before the Lord on his triumphant entry to Jerusalem. Those hankies were used for the Hosanna shout, as mentioned in verse 10. In verse 12, we see a prayer that begins and ends with Amen, which would have been the dedicatory prayer. April 6, 2000 was also the 170th anniversary of the restoration. So I had my answer. The Palmyra Temple dedication, as described in Revelation 7 and in Joel, was 
a catalyst for something to happen. So let's see what it is that happened. When you read the next chapter, Revelation 8, 1, it says, And when he had opened the seventh seal, there was silence in heaven for about the space of half an hour. So that is the half hour question. At the time, I thought this might be referring to the moment of silence that President Hinckley called for during the dedication. And I thought that for about 15 years until I decided to do the math and compare it by comparing one of God's days to ours. And here's the math. A half hour of God's time equals about 20.83 years or about the space of 20 to 20 years on earth. Later, after I did the math, I realized others had done it too, but it was kind of fun to figure it out on my own. <laughs> so 21 years also represents three sets of seven, which might be significant. So now we find ourselves in the seventh seal. But back in the sixth seal, John did introduce us to the 144,000. In Revelation 13, we read, And one of the elders answered, saying unto me, what are these which are arrayed in white robes, and whence came they? And I said unto him, Sir, thou knowest. And he said unto me, These are they which came out of great tribulation, and have washed their robes, and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Therefore they are before the throne of God, and serve him day and night in his temple. Several apostles and prophets have said that this is referring to those John saw who were foreordained in the preexistence to become the 144,000 during the tribulations. And John was not saying at this point that the tribulations are over. Remember, we are just getting ready here in these verses to enter the seventh seal. So it's obvious that the tribulations have not even begun yet at this point in his visions. While I have more information regarding the 144,000, suffice it to say that this is a symbolic number representing 12,000 of each of the 12 tribes, but it is in no way a fixed number. It is actually more of a title than a number. Just as it was in the days of Enoch after his city was taken up, they continued to come down as ministering angels and preach to those willing to listen. And as those people qualified, they were also taken up. Enoch's people did this prior to the flood, which represents baptism. We will repeat this pattern prior to the fire or sanctification of the earth. Let's stop for a moment and remember what we know about the millennium. The earth will be changed to what? A terrestrial one. And what will happen to the people left on the earth during the millennium? They will become translated. Terrestrial individuals. Remember, that's different than resurrected terrestrial beings. The 144,000 are the vanguard group, the first ones, the first fruits, his elect, those that will be changed first in order to help those during the tribulations. Are we part of that group? How can we know? In President Nelson's talk, Ministering with the Power and Authority of God, in his footnote number three, he shares the following scriptures. But first he says this, I fear that too many of our brothers and sisters do not grasp the privileges that could be theirs. Then footnote number three takes us to these scriptures where we can find out what he means by that. Doctrine and Covenants 7711. What are we to understand by the sealing the 144,000 out of all the tribes of Israel, 12,000 out of every tribe? Answer, we are to understand that those who are sealed are high priests ordained unto the holy order of God to administer the everlasting gospel. For they are they who are ordained out of every nation, kindred, tongue, and people by the angels to whom is given power over the nations of the earth to bring as many as will come to the church of the firstborn. Those angels are likely from the city of Enoch, ministering angels that will come down and take care of that. And I want to reinforce again, remember, these are footnotes, scriptures, after his comment, I fear that too many of our brothers and sisters do not grasp the privileges that could be theirs. Now we are taken to Doctrine and Covenants 107.19. To have the privilege of receiving the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven, to have the heavens opened unto them, to commune with 
the General Assembly and Church of the Firstborn, and to enjoy the communion and presence of God the Father and Jesus the Mediator of the New Covenant. To me, that infers we can achieve that in this life. And then his footnotes continue. The Joseph Smith translation of Genesis chapter 14, verse 32. And men having this faith, coming up under this order of God, were translated and taken up into heaven. That's the end of his footnote number three. But let's continue reading the rest of this Genesis translation to put it into context. Verse 33. And now Melchizedek was a priest of this order. Therefore he obtained peace in Salem and was called the Prince of Peace. And his people wrought righteousness and obtained heaven and sought for the city of Enoch, which God had before taken, separating it from the earth, having reserved it unto the latter days or end of the world, and hath said and sworn with an oath that the heavens and the earth should come together and the sons of God should be tried as so by fire. So let's recap the privileges President Nelson said that we could be accessing. We can be part of the 144,000, be part of the church of the firstborn, have our calling and election made sure, receive the mysteries of heaven, have the heavens opened, enjoy the communion and presence of God the Father and Jesus Christ. That would be second comforter experiences. Translation into a terrestrial being, which is again not the same as a resurrected being, and interact with the city of Enoch who are ministering angels to this earth. Pretty amazing promises. All right, let's talk about the chronology of the book of Revelation. According to LDS.org and other sources, if you remember, each seal represents a thousand years. The book of Revelation is in chronological order through chapter 7. That takes you through the end of the sixth seal. Then from Revelation 8 on, the seventh seal opens, and John is all over the place. It's like explaining an action-packed movie to a friend, especially one that begins in the middle and then has flashbacks and you jump forward. And he also sees many things that overlap. It helps to remember this when reading the last part of Revelation. All right, one of the ways we can know we're in the seventh seal is that some of the events of the seventh seal have started to happen. Earlier I touched on the sign of the Revelation 12 woman in the sky. So we're going to discuss that right now and how this was set into motion. And again, this is a sign that events have been set into motion. Revelation 12, 1, and there appeared a great wonder in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun and the moon under her feet and upon her head a crown of 12 stars. And she being with child cried, travailing in birth and pain to be delivered. So in November of 2016, Jupiter, which is known as the king planet, moved into the midsection of Virgo, where it stayed there in retrograde motion for 42 weeks, the gestation period of a human child. When Jupiter left Virgo on September 23rd, 2017, it was the eve of Rosh Hashanah. Remember, we talked about how holy days and signs when they align uh, is another way to know if that's the sign or event that we're looking for. As Jupiter exited Virgo, for the first time in 7,000 years, these stars were all aligned. The sun was at her shoulder, the moon was at her feet, and there was a crown of 12 stars at her head. Constellation Leo, which has nine stars, and Mercury, Mars, and Venus. Pretty amazing, right? And NASA has a program and there's several other star constellation programs out there where you can go in and plug in any date in the future or in the past and know exactly where the stars were in the sky or will, where they will be. So let's decipher what this means. According to LDS.org, the woman is the church. The crown of 12 stars are the apostles. 
the man child is the kingdom of God on the earth, which includes the 144,000 and those charged with building the new Jerusalem. Revelation 12:5 says, and she brought forth a man child, which is the kingdom of God on the earth, who was to rule all nations with a rod of iron. And that is direct revelation with Christ, which suggests that the 144,000 and those in the new Jerusalem will communicate directly with him. And her child was caught up unto God, unto his throne. And that's a reference to the 144,000, where they are taken up and translated into terrestrial beings. And the woman, which is the church, fled into the wilderness where she hath a place prepared of God, that they should feed her there a thousand two hundred and threescore days, which is three and a half years, or the first part of the tribulation, which is known as the time of trouble. The second three and a half years is referenced later in Revelation 12 as it speaks of the remnant of the woman or the church who have a testimony, but who had not yet been translated. This appears to be those who are protected during the day of Jehovah or during the great tribulation. Again, this was a sign that things have been set into motion. More puzzle pieces to consider. In 1948, Israel became a nation. Keeping in mind that scriptures have layered and multiple meanings, let's consider what Daniel says in 924. Seventy weeks or years are determined upon thy people and thy holy city to finish the transgression and to make an end of sins and to make reconciliation for iniquity and to bring in everlasting righteousness and seal up the vision and prophecy and to anoint the most holy. Now this event took place at the destruction of the second temple in Jesus's time and Daniel had foreseen that prophecy happening but here we can use that same prophecy again 25 know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the commandment to restore and build Jerusalem unto the Messiah the Prince shall be seven weeks and three score and two weeks or 69 years so if we use that 70th year of Israel becoming a nation, what can we see? When you add 70 years to 1948, you end up in 2018. And then Daniel references the 69th year as well, so we'll look at that in a minute. But 70 years after Israel became a nation, on the very anniversary day of May 14, 2018, we moved the U.S. Embassy from Tel Aviv to Jerusalem. 70 years to the day. So again, you end up in 2018, 70 years later. So we know that that was important and an event that means something. Daniel also told us to watch for the 69th year too. So let's see what happened in 2017. In August 2017, a total eclipse took place across the United States. This was a rare event. Sometimes they'll happen over the edge of a country or out in the middle of the ocean is usually where they take place. But this one crossed over the United States completely. And immediately following this eclipse came three witnesses in the form of the three record-breaking costliest hurricanes in U.S. history. One of them was named Jose, aka Joseph, and the other one was named Maria, also known as Mary. So you have the eclipse, two, and then you have two hurricanes named Mary and Joseph moving in onto the U.S. continent, and then you have the sign of Revelation 12, which is the Virgin or Mary giving birth to a child. Also, 2017 was the 70th Jubilee since the Exodus from Egypt. And remember, a Jubilee is seven Shemitahs of seven years each, the 49th, 50th year being the Jubilee. And here on this incredible timeline, we can see how Jubilees have played 
a really important role since creation, or at least since Adam and Eve left the garden, since we're not sure how long they were in the garden. But you can see that the first 2,000 years, there were 40 jubilees. And on the 40th jubilee, Abraham was born and Noah died. Then 500 years more pass, and we have the 50th jubilee. And that was when the exodus took place. And then another 500 years, and we have the 60th Jubilee, and the first temple was complete. 500 more years is the 70th Jubilee, and that was the decree to restore Jerusalem. Another 500 years pass, and you have the 80th Jubilee, which is when Christ was born, his first coming. And then we have a mirrored version on the other end here, 2,000 years on each end. And so we're now in the 120th Jubilee which is when Christ, his reign begins. And this is the end of part two of four videos on Daniel and Revelation. But it just keeps getting more exciting in the next two videos. So I hope you'll join us there. See you soon.